Hey, Guru Nation, how's it going? Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, share. Look, I'm going to keep this one short and sweet. It's a combination of questions I've been getting this week. And again, I really appreciate you guys and gals for watching and taking the time out to send me questions. Even if I don't get back to you right away, it gets stuck up here, okay? And then I, I come to my thinking place and I turn on the LEDs. And I turn on the misters when it's hot and I just start thinking, all right, what am I going to do? How, how am I going to combine these questions? So these are coordinator questions I got. The theme for these last few days has been study coordinator. So the first one is, and we're, we're going to start technical and work our way up to more philosophical. So the first one is, how do you know as a CRC, how do you know the difference between a protocol amendment and just the newest version of the protocol? You got to go by the IRB, all right? The most recently approved version of the protocol by the IRB is the current protocol. It doesn't matter if there's an amendment in draft. Until it's IRB approved by your IRB, you can't use it. So that's number one. Number two, how do you know when it gets approved? That's actually a good question. Your CRA would be a huge help in this. But also the IRB itself, and they're supposed to post outcome documents like some of the IRBs call them, or at least notifications. What's been worrying me lately is a lot of these IRBs are not even posting like notifications when something gets approved. Uh, but you're supposed to check with your IRB and check your dashboard, your portal every day. Most of these IRBs now have an online portal where you can check. So once that amendment's approved, you know what you got to do. You got to retrain all staff on the new version of the protocol. The PI has to sign the protocol signature page. There's most likely going to be an informed consent that needs to be amended once that's approved by the IRB. Any patient that's ongoing in the study needs to sign it, as well as obviously any future patient that enrolls in the study needs to sign the latest informed consent. Now, how do you know? How do you know what the changes are? Do you have to read the entire protocol? No. Most sponsors are nice enough to provide a summary of changes along with the amendment. So it will basically be like one or two pages of exactly what it sounds like. What are the changes to the protocol from the previous amendment? So that's always very nice. You don't have to reread the entire thing. The next question is related to clinical knowledge. So this person say, you know what, Dan, like how much medical slash clinical knowledge does a coordinator actually need to do their job? The answer is you don't, but of course it's helpful if you have some kind of a medical background, CNAs, LVNs, IMGs, which are international medical graduates. Obviously the more of an in-depth knowledge you have of clinical matters, specifically related to your therapeutic areas that you're doing your studies in, the better, the easier it is going to be for you to do your job. One of the things that my latest hire, Katie, who has not really, she doesn't have a medical background. She's in school to get her doctorate right now for in physical therapy. So it is medical, um, but she doesn't have knowledge of medication, like pharmacology. She doesn't know what meds are used for what conditions. But part of her job is in pre-screening is going through patients' con meds in their charts and looking at the protocol and cross-checking and saying, okay, is this part of the inclusion exclusion criteria? What she's done in her first two weeks is amazing. I mean, she's Googled dozens of drugs, figured out different classes of drugs. This is an anticonvulsant. This is an anticoagulant. Of course, you're going to gain that knowledge. It's almost impossible if you're a coordinator working at a small enough site, it's impossible not to gain this kind of knowledge, which is why I always say small is the new big work if you're really trying to leverage lever level up your skill set quickly the smaller the research clinic the better because you're going to be doing all kinds of stuff and in a very short amount of time you're going to be gaining generalist skills now the first time i'm announcing this ever my next book and i have no idea when it's going to come out i'm in the very very early brainstorming stages i probably shouldn't even mention it but i will it's actually going to be about medical, pharmacology, physiological, pathophysiological, um, 
various conditions, like the most important conditions in our industry and research. And as you can tell, like, I don't even have like a very clear idea for what the book's actually going to be about, but it's essentially going to be to help coordinators or CRAs or people just with zero medical background learn like enough to be dangerous, enough to at least learn where they need to look further for further research uh, to do their jobs better. So that's coming out soon. You heard it here first. The last question is, uh, if I'm a CRC, well, there's actually two more questions. They get more and more philosophical. If I'm a CRC, how do I become a CRA? Like I'm having problems getting hired. I really want to work at the CRO level, but I'm, I feel like I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong because I'm not getting calls back. And this, it turns out this person only applied to like three places. The lowest hanging fruit and probably the best is going, approaching your CRAs if you can. If you can do so in a professional manner and say, hey, I'd like to keep this between you and I, but I'm looking to get in at a CRO or a sponsor level. Do you think you can help me? You'd be surprised. A lot of these CRAs are actually instructed on what to do when coordinators approach them in situations like this. So they might even get like some kind of incentive to have you join. They're not going to go and steal people, steal coordinators from sites. But if a coordinator makes the initiative, takes the initiative to ask them for help, a lot of these CROs actually have policies in place for their CRAs. Well, confirm if I'm wrong in the comments. Confirm or deny uh, the accuracy of this. But from what I hear, it's anecdotal. Um, but even if it's not, even if they don't have incentives, it's still a good place to go. I know so many CRAs who have worked with CRCs and then helped them get jobs in the industry at the CRO or sponsor level. So start there. Another place is um, your local local. SOCRA and ACRP chapters, Society of Clinical Research Associates and Association of Clinical Research Professionals. The local meetups, you're going to be amazed who you meet. LinkedIn, I keep, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but LinkedIn, if you actually engage with people and not just spam people, but build somewhat meaningful relationships by engaging with people's comments and posts and then slowly starting to message them that's a way to network. Last question, I promise. I'm just grouping them all in. How do I even start at a site? I'm not working at a site, but I want to work at a site. And you're telling me I should approach research sites. What do I approach? All the job postings I see are bachelor's degree and higher or require experience, blah, blah, blah. Look, you know what sites need if you watch these videos. And let me tell you if you, if you haven't. They need getting studies. They need getting more patients. They need help uh, with social marketing and digital marketing, and they need help with other clinicians in the community. If you could do one, two, three, or all four of those things, and you have a willingness to learn, and you have an attitude to just win and, and deliver positive outcomes for the site, you're in. Problem is, it's a big world out there. They have no idea who's able to do this. So the fact that you are watching YouTube videos, the fact that you are taking the initiative to even ask this question, you just need to demonstrate that to them. So approach a dozen sites in a month and say, hey, I watched this guy on YouTube. He told me that you need help with this. I have learned from his videos how to do this. I'm really interested in this industry. I'll volunteer for a week. You won't have to volunteer longer than a week these days. The industry is so hot. There's new studies now. Constantly, these sites, especially the smaller ones, are needing help. So that's your ticket to get in. It's always to put yourself in their shoes and not the other way around. Stop thinking about what they think about you. You think about what they need. Watch my videos to find out what they need. I've interviewed dozens of site owners. You can connect with all of them on LinkedIn. You can talk to them. You can see what they're commenting on other people's posts on LinkedIn. And then you can get in, get in where you fit in, throw your pitch. This is why they need you. What site wouldn't want to go get her? Self-reliant, self-starter, ambitious, willing to put in the work without anyone telling them to. That just shows that you have so much potential. So that's the way to do it. Of course, it doesn't help if you have a medical background. Like, subscribe, comment, share. Good luck, Guru Nation. Let me know what you think about all this. I really want to hear your comments, questions, concerns, 
feedback middle of 2022 industry strong take care